This is the last chapter in general chemistry. It's going to be on nuclear chemistry. We'll start our discussion on nuclear chemistry by discussing nuclear stability. Then we'll talk about the two main nuclear reactions, fission and fusion. We'll talk a little bit about detecting and measuring radioactivity, and then we'll talk about some applications of nuclear chemistry, specifically about some medical applications. Let's introduce nuclear chemistry by comparing it to a conventional chemical reaction. So in a conventional chemical reaction, bonds are either made or broken between atoms, and that's usually the result of electron sharing or exchange to make those new bonds. So in this chemical reaction, nitrogen gas is reacting with hydrogen gas to form ammonia gas. So nitrogen here, I have a triple bond between the two nitrogen atoms. I must break that bond. I have a single bond between these hydrogen atoms. I must break all those. And as part of the reaction, I start to form new bonds. In this case, I'm sharing two electrons between this hydrogen and nitrogen, this hydrogen and nitrogen, this hydrogen and nitrogen, and the same over here for my second molecule of ammonia. I have shared electrons forming covalent bonds. In a nuclear chemical reaction, I'm not looking at the electrons being shared or exchanged. I'm specifically looking at changes in the nucleus. So the change in the number of protons or neutrons within the nucleus, that is usually accompanied by either an emission of radiation or another atomic particle. In this example, I have atomic nitrogen reacting with a neutron. So I bombard nitrogen with a neutron. What that causes is a chemical reaction. It actually causes one of the neutrons in the nucleus to eject a proton. So I'm converting nitrogen, which has seven protons, into carbon, which has six protons, and I eject a proton from that system. This is a nuclear chemical reaction. Nuclear chemical reaction often occur in isotopes of a element. In this case, I'm looking at the three different isotopes of carbon. Each of these carbon atoms has six protons, therefore it's carbon. This carbon atom over on the left-hand side has six neutrons, so we call it carbon-12. This carbon here in the center has seven neutrons, so it's called carbon-13. And this carbon on the far hand right side has eight neutrons in its nucleus, so we call it carbon-14. Carbon-14 is unstable, so it wants to undergo a nuclear reaction. In this case, it wants to decay. It actually wants to emit a neutron or proton or change a neutron to a proton. In the case of carbon-14, it undergoes nuclear decay to change one of the protons, one of the neutrons, into a proton, converting it from carbon to nitrogen. And in the process, it emits an electron, and it also emits an anti-neutrino, radiation that interacts with things as it decays. So this is also a nuclear reaction. If we look at a periodic table of isotopes, it tells us the percentage of isotopes that occur naturally in the environment. For example, if I look over here at carbon, I notice that, and I were to blow that up a little bit, you'd see that most of the carbon in the world is carbon-12. There is very little carbon-14 out there in our environment. When carbon-14 does exist, it wants to decay. It wants to undergo a nuclear reaction to produce nitrogen. Some of these other elements, you can see that palladium here has a lot of different isotopes, as shown here by the colors in these charts here. 
Some of these elements down here do not have any isotopes, which means they're actually very unstable. So if I form polonium, it wants to decay and form into something else. So there are no isotopes of polonium that occur naturally in the environment. Let's take a look at some isotopes and look at their nuclear reactions. So if I look at tin and I look at the distribution of isotopes, you can see tin 120 and tin 118 and 16 and 19 are very prominent in the environment where some of these other isotopes, tin 115 and 114, are in very small percentages. That's because they're most likely radioactive. Here I'm looking at carbon. Notice that even on this chart here, I do not actually can show carbon-14 because it occurs in such a small amount in the world. Cadmium, thorium, and uranium. If I look in uranium-235 and 234, they are very unstable and they want to decay because they have an unstable number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus. So the nucleus of an atom becomes, becomes unstable if it contains too many or too few neutrons relative to the number of the protons. It turns out that the neutrons are sort of buffering all the protons that are in a nucleus because they're positive charges, they repel each other. So I have to have a certain number of neutrons in the nucleus to make it stable. So the forces inside the atom result in the breaking of part of the nucleus and releasing particles to make them more stable. And isotopes are a good way to do that. If I take the periodic chart and I plot on my x-axis the number of protons, that determines what element I have here. So if I have six protons, that's carbon. If I have seven protons, that is gonna be chlorine. So it determines what the element is. Here is just on the y-axis is the number of neutrons. And if I plot the stable elements in the world, I can actually plot them here as a function of the number of protons and the number of neutrons. Notice that the number of neutrons relative to the number of protons goes up as I go up in the periodic chart here. So this red line represents a one-to-one -one neutron to proton ratio. Above this red line, the elements all contain more neutrons than they do protons. If I look at thorium-234, thorium-234 contains 90 protons. That defines it as thorium. One of the isotopes of thorium contains 144 neutrons. Together, that gives me an atomic mass of 234 neutrons plus protons, and I still have 90 electrons and 90 protons in that molecule. So this is sort of a stability curve. What I can do is if I take a closer look in here, we can see which ones are stable and which ones are not stable with a little closer identification of those. If I look at that section of the last chart and blow it up between 60 protons and 80 protons, and then I'll also look at the number of neutrons, I can see there are a large number of different isotopes. So as I go up the chart, here is an atom at 75, which only has 85 protons. There's also an isotope that has 75 protons, but has 118 neutrons in it. So it's different. They're same element, but they have different stabilities. If I look at this sort of blue area in here, the dark blue here, that's the non-radioactive, that's the stable isotopes of those elements. If I have too many neutrons, they want to undergo a chemical reaction to reduce the number of neutrons and go down this chart. If I have too few neutrons, I want to undergo a chemical reaction to actually change the relative ratio of neutrons to protons to move up this chart. And to do that, there are several different chemical reactions, nuclear chemical reactions that I can undergo. If I want to move down the chart, I go undergo something called beta emission. 
and we're going to talk about that in a second. If I'm in this gray region here, I undergo something called positron emission or electron capture. And if I'm in these orange regions here, I undergo something called alpha emission. And so those are my four different types of emission that'll change the neutron to proton ratio to make them into a stable isotope. Let's first look at alpha emission. So in this example, I have a nucleus where my atomic number is 83. If it undergoes a nuclear reaction to emit an alpha particle, an alpha particle is actually just a helium atom. In other words, I'm going to lose two protons and two neutrons. So I lose both of those. Okay. And when I do that, I change this into a completely different element. That's because I have lost two protons. Therefore, this has changed its composition. It's no longer the same element. Alpha admission, eliminating a helium atom. Beta emission is actually an emission which emits an electron or a beta particle. So if for in this example, I start with carbon-14. It undergoes a radioactive decay to release a beta particle or an electron. In the process, one of my neutrons is actually converted over to a proton. And if I change the number of protons in my nucleus, I change the elemental nature of that molecule. Carbon has been converted into nitrogen. That's beta decay. Another type of emission that occurs simultaneously with some nuclear reactions is gamma emission. In the example shown here, I have uranium-238. It undergoes alpha decay and so it emits an alpha particle, and at the same time, it releases what is known as a gamma ray, which is electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation that is very high in energy. So it's very damaging to human tissue and biological tissue. So when I go from uranium-238, I lose two protons and two neutrons. By losing two protons, I go from uranium to thorium, and now I have 90 protons in my nucleus, and I give off a very high energy gamma ray. Positron emission is a nuclear reaction where my parent nucleus has too few neutrons to make it stable, so it has to convert one of my protons into a neutron, and it does that by a process called positron emission. So in this case, when I undergo a nuclear reaction, I emit a positron, which is just the opposite of an electron. Okay. And in the process, one of my protons is now converted into a neutron. And so I've changed the chemical identity again of my atom. I've gone from a molecule that has a certain number of protons, and now it has one less proton and it has more neutrons, making it more stable. And the final nuclear chemical reaction that we'll talk about in this class is where, again, I have a nucleus that is neutron poor. It needs another neutron or more to make it more stable. If I can capture an electron into the nucleus, I can convert one of the protons into a neutron, changing the neutron to proton ratio, making it more stable. In this process, I have also changed the identity of the atom also because I've converted one of the protons into a neutron. So let's summarize those reactions. If I have an unstable nucleus because I have too many neutrons in the nucleus, I can actually undergo beta emission, which converts one of the neutrons into a proton, reducing the neutron to proton ratio. If I have nuclei that are have too few neutrons in the nucleus, I can un either undergo positron emission, converting a proton into a neutron, 
or I can do an electron capture, taking a proton plus an electron to make a new neutron, or I can actually emit an alpha particle, which actually ejects two protons and two neutrons, which changes my ratio of neutrons to protons slightly, moving everything toward this more stable blue area where the nucleus is a more stable atomic structure. The ratio of neutrons to protons holds it all together. Let's now talk about two nuclear reactions that involve nuclear decay, but also involve the interaction between different particles to create vast amounts of energy. We typically call those either nuclear fusion or nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is a nuclear reaction where I have a very heavy nuclei with a lot of neutrons and protons that literally fragments into smaller molecules. For example, if I were to take uranium-235 and I bombard it with a neutron, it causes it to be unstable. And in the process, that whole nucleus breaks in half, essentially, and I get krypton-91 and barium-142. And in the process, I release a tremendous amount of energy and I release more neutrons. Those neutrons then can actually collide with more atoms of uranium-235, creating more barium and krypton, creating more neutrons. Essentially, I have a chain reaction. This is called nuclear fission. And the energy that is released, if I have enough uranium close together and bombard it with neutrons, is tremendous. And that's how nuclear weapons that are fission-based are created. A second type of nuclear reaction which results in a high amount of energy produced is nuclear fusion. That's where we take two very small nuclei and combine them. In this example, I take a proton and a proton and they come together under high temperatures and high pressure to form a isotope of hydrogen and it releases an electron. So I fuse them together to form hydrogen that is a isotope of hydrogen. That then after it loses electron, it gives off some energy. That hydrogen then can be slammed into by a proton also, which combines them to make helium isotope, which is missing one of the neutrons. And in that process, it releases energy. Then I can also have helium bumping into helium-4, which then creates more protons and a chain reaction again. And in the process, I liberate a lot of energy. This is nuclear fusion, which we're trying to harness this energy right now to make unlimited amount of power instead of using fossil fuels or solar or wind power. Let's compare the amount of energy that we can get out of five different types of energy sources and compare them and let's compare them per mole of starting material. So if I look at solar cells, I typically for each different mole of material I have, I get approximately one times 10 to the minus two kilojoules per mole. Very inefficient, very little energy. If I look at hydrogen bonds, if I were to break those, for an example, in a dam here, I can get one to 10 kilojoules per mole of energy out of those. If I were looking at battery powers, I can get somewhere between 100 and 900 kilojoules per mole. If we were to look at combustion, which is our major source of energy right now in the world, we typically get about 1,000 to 10,000 kilojoules per mole of material that we burn. But all these are fairly inefficient when I compare those to nuclear fusion or nuclear fission. In that case, I literally get 16 billion to 17 billion kilojoules per mole of material. You can see from an efficiency standpoint, per mole, nuclear fusion is one of the best ways perceivable to go. The issue is, of course, that I generate radioact material, radioactive emissions and materials, and those can be harmful. So we have to learn how to do that without endangering ourselves. So how does a nuclear 
fission reactor actually work and typically they're based on uranium 235 or 234 here I have something called fuel elements and that's my radioactive sources there if I bring these rods out of the way I actually bring my uranium close together and so the neutrons start hitting each other and hitting the uranium and they start a chain reaction occurring as that chain reaction occurs they generate energy that energy heats up water water is pumped around it that water is converted to steam that steam turns a turbine which generates electricity I cool that water down and pump it back in to get heated up one more time so that's essentially what we're using we're using the nuclear reaction to heat water to boil water to form steam which terms turns a steam turbine when you think of nuclear fusion reactors the issues of generating these high energy particles to sustain a chain reaction are difficult because the energy tends to dissipate fast so people are building very sophisticated containment systems with very high magnetic fields in order to contain that nuclear reaction but they too would heat up water and then eventually create electricity by turning a steam turbine we've probably seen movies here where they talk about limitless energy doc fusion here as in the back to the future and someday people think that is very realistic thing to have happen to have very small nuclear fusion reactors that power our lifestyles the most common way to measure radiation is using a Geiger counter what that is is it's like this container here which contains argon gas we then put a current between them so I charge this inner electrode put a positive charge on it I put a negative charge on this outside container here which is also made out of metal if radiation enters this tube it knocks loose any electrons that are on the negatively charged system and then it bumps into the positively charged rod here and creates a current and I can detect that current on a meter so a Geiger counter so if we look at common radioactive things in our lives if you have a smoke alarm in your house you probably have a radioactive device in your house that smoke detector some of them contain americium 241 which decays into NP 237 and it emits an alpha particle and a gamma particle I'll talk a little bit about how that is transformed into a smoke detector here in the next slide if you have bananas in your house there are lots of potassium in bananas and potassium has an abundant amount of radioactive potassium 40 which decays into calcium 40 plus a beta particle so if you put a Geiger counter up to a banana it would start to register radioactivity if you have some old pottery some of these very colorful gla colorful glazes that were used in the early 1900s contain uranium 238 because it sort of gave a nice shade of color to it so if you put a Geiger counter up to some old pottery you're gonna get a strong signal uranium 238 going to down to thorium 234 and admitting an alpha particle and it's these particles here that we're actually detecting using our Geiger counters in this case an alpha and a gamma particle in the case of bananas we get a beta particle and in the case of our old pottery we get an alpha particle that we detect let's take a closer look at how we can use radioactive materials such as americium to actually make a smoke detector so the first thing you need is an americium source which is mined out of different mines in the united states we isolate that americium and we place it in the smoke detector we place it below two different electrodes we have a positive electrode and a negative electrode as my americium decays it gives off alpha particles which causes the ions to actually ionize between these two plates and I set up a current if smoke enters in this chamber here between the two plates it literally blocks those 
alpha particles from ionizing the gases around it and its mass changes different and so it changes the amount of electricity that is detected between those two plates. So all I need is a detector to measure the current now between the two plates. If smoke enters in, it interacts with the alpha particles and it causes a difference in the observed current flowing between the two different plates. I've created a smoke detector. So how damaging is radiation. It really depends on the penetration dip, depth and how what the, the flux of radiation is. For example, alpha particles which contain two protons and two neutrons are fairly large particles and they can be stopped with just about anything. They won't penetrate your even penetrate your skin. A beta particle, which is an electron, is very small and high energy, and it'll penetrate through your skin, through your hand, and as it passes through, it interacts with your tissue. If I have a thin sheet of aluminum, it has actually stops that beta radiation. Gamma radiation is high energy, and it will penetrate skin, tissue, it'll penetrate aluminum, cardboard, things like that. One of the dense materials that we have, which is high, uh, heavy material for its size, it actually is one of the materials that can actually stop gamma radiation. So when I look at nuclear materials, they're usually contained in lead boxes to keep that radiation from penetrating into the environment. So I have alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. When we're measuring radioactivity using a Geiger counter or some other device, we want to actually give that measurement some units. And those units depend on nationality and they also depend on whether we're just measuring the radioactivity in general or we want to relate it to how damaging it is to things like human tissue. If we're looking at decay events, we often measure radioactivity in Becquerel or Curries, which are how many events occur per second. If we're looking at energy absorbed, we often use grays or we use rads. If we're looking at tissue damage, we use the term sieverts or REMS, and then we relate those to how many much energy as actually per kilogram of material here. So one sievert equals one joule per kilogram. And a sievert is sort of the universal IUPAC method for measuring energy because it contains joules and kilograms. Some other properties of radiation, if we look at just the amount of energy that's evolved, we can see that an alpha particle has three to nine milli electron volts. A beta particle, particle has zero to three million electron volts, and a gamma particle has 10 kilo electron volts to about 10 milli million electron volts. And so if I look at how far those radiations penetrate in water, you can see the alpha particle goes just barely into the water, whereas a beta particle can go up to four millimeters, and a gamma particle can go up to 20 centimeters in water. And when we think about tissue, human tissue or animal tissue, we think there's a lot of water. Or we know there's a lot of water in tissue. So this is a good measure for how far those particles, that type of radiation that will penetrate into tissue also. As radiation penetrates tissues, it ionizes molecules. When it ionizes molecules, it breaks bonds. So it can break bonds in just skin tissue, muscle tissue, or even down at the cellular level, it can start breaking down DNA molecules, which will cause defects in our DNA, which causes things like cancer and so forth like that. So what are some of the levels that we can tolerate? Because there's always radiation coming from the sky. There's radiation coming from the ground due to radon. So a typical chest x-ray here gives about 0.1 millisieverts of energy. And I can sort of look up here at 
say somebody that works as a nuclear plant making energy, they receive about 20 millisieverts per year. Those levels are considered tolerable, meaning that they're low levels and they would be applicable to what a normal person would get during the year. If I look at intermediate or moderate levels of radiation, I can see that if I'm exposed to radiation, like at Fukushima nuclear power plant, that would be 400 millisieverts in just four hours of exposure. And if I looked at high risk, risks where we have high levels of radiation, if you get exposed directly to something like uranium-238 or something like that, you can get 10,000 millisieverts of radiation, and that's typically lethal in less than a few days. So if I get exposed through the air or through light, I can that radiation can ionize molecules in my eyes and actually trigger cataracts. If I have hormonal issues I, and radiation penetrates into my thyroid, the radioactive iodine that's in our system tends to build up and children are at risk. If you actually are exposed to radiation through breathing, you can actually start destroying some of the tissue in your lungs and then you tend to get lung cancer. Same thing with eating radioactive materials. If I have high doses of radiation on my skin, such as gamma rays from the outer atmosphere or some other ionizing radiation, I can start getting skin cancer. And finally, if radiation is transported through my bloodstream to different cells, I can actually start to create uh, white blood cells and red cells that are defective, meaning I've ionized some of those molecules to create diseases such as leukemia. One sort of interesting way of using radiation to determine the age of objects is through carbon-14 dating. Carbon-14 is a radio active isotope of carbon and it has a very well-known decay rate meaning I know how many carbon atoms will decay per year and it turns out that if I have carbon-14 in tissue it has a half-life of 5730 years so half of the carbon that is carbon-14 will turn into nitrogen in 5730 years I can use this because carbon-14 in the atmosphere is a constant, and it's been constant for a long period of time. It's created through cosmic rays interacting with nuclei in the atmosphere, and it generates nitrogen-14, which decays into carbon-14. When that carbon-14 is then turned into glucose through the photosynthesis process, at that point, I've locked in how much carbon is in a living organism. So sunlight and carbon-14 go into making plants, animals eat plants, and so all that carbon that is carbon-14 is in that animal or in that plant. Once that animal or plant dies, you are no longer eating any carbon-14, so the carbon-14 level stays constant until it decays. And we just measure the amount of carbon-14 in a dead organism, and by that we can use its half-life to determine how long ago that animal or plant passed away. If we can localize radiation, we can actually use that radiation to kill unwanted cells by ionizing them. And we do that through the use of PET scans, which is using the radioisotope of fluorine. We could do leukemia therapy using phosphorus-32 by ingesting it. We can do other cancer therapies by localizing where cobalt-60 decays, giving off both beta particles and gamma radiation, again, ionizing bad cells in the body. And there's a few other types of radiation we use. One is technotinium, 99, and iodine, 1 
23. Again, depending on where those isotopes and how they are delivered to the system, whether they're injected, whether they're focused in there, or whether you have a whole body exposure to different things, you can actually try to kill the cancer cells in a body or a living organism. That's the end of general chemistry. We're now going to move on to organic chemistry. And the first chapter we're going to study is alkanes.